Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed on this stormy Monday afternoon. Today I'm going to be divulging a bit more information about AMD's Ryzen Mobile 4000 APUs. I spent a week in AMD's Austin offices back in February to go over all the key information on Ryzen 4000 APUs and the embargo on at least some of this information has expired so get prepared for a deluge of little details and tidbits. Now the original plan was to have Ryzen Mobile 4000 APU benchmarks for you today however laptops that actually use Ryzen 4000 have been delayed due to a certain case of human malware. We will be able to talk Ryzen Mobile performance next month at this stage but as it stands right now unfortunately I cannot show you any benchmarks that I've run only the data that AMD has presented at its tech day in February. To complicate things further, one of the reasons we can share this information today and not later when we can show benchmarks is that some Ryzen 4000 systems are going on sale or at least will be available for pre-order in some nations starting today. The one system I've heard this applying to is the ASUS Zephyrus G14 with H series Ryzen processors. That should be available shortly and like I said, hopefully we can show off some benchmarks using this system as soon as possible. Aside from a bit of confusion around this launch, which really is the case with a lot of launches since the impact of human malware, I think this one is going to be very exciting and really push the laptop market forward in a significant way, so let's dive into the details. AMD already shared some information on the Ryzen Mobile 4000 product stack at CES, so let's recap some of that information briefly. All Ryzen 4000 APUs use AMD's latest Zen 2 architecture and are built using 7 nanometer technology with a monolithic die that also incorporates a Vega-based GPU. The 15 watt U series includes 5 SKUs covering Ryzen 3 through Ryzen 7 with up to 8 cores and 16 threads in the highest end part, with clock speeds topping out in the 4.2 GHz range under boost conditions. There's also a maximum of 8 graphics compute units on the die, with a significant clock speed bump up to 1750 MHz for the Ryzen 7 4800U. This is all old news, so if you want more discussion on the SKUs and specs, check out our video on Ryzen Mobile from CES 2020. AMD also revealed the Ryzen 4000 H series, which at the time was announced to include two SKUs, the Ryzen 7 4800H as an 8-core part and Ryzen 5 4600H as a 6-core part, both with 45-watt TDPs. However, AMD has announced today that there are several other SKUs in the lineup, most notably the Ryzen 9 4900H. Now, basic core configuration of the Ryzen 9 4900H is the same as the Ryzen 7 4800H in that it's an 8-core, 16-thread CPU with 12 megabytes of level 3 cache and a 45-watt TDP. However, it appears as though AMD is binning these CPUs aggressively to deliver extra performance for those that grab a Ryzen 9 system. The 4900H ups the boost frequency to 4.4 GHz, but crucially, the base frequency gets a substantial bump from 2.9 to 3.3 GHz. While these specs don't necessarily indicate the actual clock speeds the part will run at under sustained workloads, that figure tends to be a mystery with most mobile chips until you actually test them, this is still quite a substantial upgrade. This indicates that the 4900H will be able to clock itself higher and perform better within the same TDP limit, a likely result of binning, similar to what we saw with the Ryzen 9 3900X and 3950X on the desktop side. Through chiplet binning, the 3950X was able to offer more cores and extra performance while consuming roughly the same amount of power as the 3900X. The 4900H also brings an increase to GPU compute units, giving us the fully unlocked 8 cores with a 1750MHz clock speed. This won't make a lot of difference to most H-series systems that will opt for discrete graphics instead, so the CPU improvements really are the key here. The Ryzen 9 4900H will be available in the spring of 2020 alongside the Ryzen 9 4900HS, a specially binned 35 watt version of the chip that does feature slightly lower clock speeds but promises better efficiency. In fact, the 4900HS at 35 watts is clocked higher than the 4800H at 45 watts, again, I suspect a product of binning. As AMD already announced, there will also be a Ryzen 7 4800HS at 35 watts, which will be used in laptops like the Zephyrus G14 
and there's a Ryzen 5 HS model as well. But AMD was keen to emphasize that the HS series isn't just about getting more efficient CPUs. For an OEM to have access to these chips, they'll have to closely work with AMD on the design and validation of the system and use other highly efficient components in the system. This will include power efficient displays, high performance, low power memory, top tier SSDs and other things. The idea here is that if you are buying a laptop with an HS series CPU, it's the best of what AMD has to offer in laptop form. U-series buyers aren't getting left out either. While there are no S chips in the U-series, AMD is also working more closely with their partners than ever before to ensure OEMs aren't just pumping out garbage laptops like has been the case in the past. Part of this is once again validating a number of key components like the display, SSD and memory to ensure that high quality stuff is being used by OEMs. And beyond that, AMD is putting more of a focus on validation after these laptops ship to ensure the driver experience remains rock solid for owners over the lifespan of the system. We'll see how that plays out, but it's the biggest commitment AMD has made in the mobile space for a long time. Let's move into some performance numbers. These are gonna be, of course, AMD's performance numbers. As always, it's important to take results like this with a grain of salt, especially as we can't provide our own performance information just yet. And throughout the charts you're about to see, AMD have used reference systems with these APUs installed rather than actual retail units, of course, because retail units aren't available yet. So yeah, just keep all that stuff in mind. AMD only showed vague Cinebench numbers at CES, so here are the actual results for the Ryzen 7 4800U and 4700U. The 4800U is the 8-core 16-thread model, while the 4700U is 8 cores and 8 threads. The numbers here for the 4800U are undoubtedly quite impressive, with the 4800U offering 90% more multi-thread performance than the Ice Lake Core i7-1065G7 and 37% more than the 6-core Comet Lake Core i7-1710U. However, that's not the whole story here. AMD has used Dell XPS 13 test systems across all of these benchmarks, and the XPS 13 is well known to be configured to use a 25 watt power limit rather than the default 15 watt these chips normally ship with. In the 10th generation, it's a little different than previous generations in that a lot more systems are coming with the 25 watt power configuration out of the box. There are far fewer 15 watt systems being used right now. So these numbers that AMD is showing are going to be represented of most Ice Lake and Comet Lake systems in the 10th generation, but it is important to note that all the Intel numbers here are 25 watt numbers. Meanwhile, AMD's reference platform is locked to 15 watts long term. Of course, both CPUs also have boost behavior, but the configured TDPs here are different. 25 watts for Intel, 15 watts for AMD. I spotted this because the numbers for the various Intel CPUs here are closer to what I see in my own testing from 25 watt configurations. Scores at 15 watts are much lower. For example, my Razorblade Stealth with a Core i7-1065G7 only scores 1168 points in the multi-threaded test at 15 watts. And for the 10710U, I usually saw scores around 1500 at 15 watts. We'll have to dive into this further when we get hands-on time with actual Ryzen 4000 U series laptops, but on face value, it looks like AMD's 8-core chips could be twice as fast as Intel's best 6-core offering when both systems are configured to the same TDP. You'll also see graphics performance here, which has the Ryzen 7 4800U about 28% ahead of Ice Lake in 3D Mark Time Spy. But again, this is with the 1065G7 configured to 25 watts. Our 15 watt numbers would put the 4800U more like twice as fast. Again, we'll explore that more in detail in the coming months when we actually get hands on with some of these units. AMD also shared a ton more performance breakdowns with the Ryzen 7 series up against Core i7, most of which favor the AMD processor in one way or another. In some circumstances, the chip isn't faster, like with PC Mark 10's Office application benchmark, but most of the time, and especially for creator workloads, the difference is quite substantial, again, according to AMD. Here are some gaming numbers for the Ryzen 4000 U series, showing very solid performance at 1080p with low settings, often significantly outperforming Ice Lake depending on the title. And here's the difference between AMD's 15 and 25 watt configurations, although I suspect the numbers here are a bit on the conservative side. AMD also showed off Ryzen 5 U-series performance, once again showing a substantial performance lead over the competition. Here we're looking at an AMD 6-core part up against Intel's quad cores, and the core difference, plus the advantages of 7 nanometer efficiency, deliver quite huge gains for AMD in this market. 
And then we do have some limited numbers for the Ryzen 3 series as well. AMD are only offering a quad-core chip here, but that's still a decent improvement over Intel's Core i3 Ice Lake offering that they're comparing it to. AMD didn't have as much information on H-series performance, although we did see some numbers for a few of the chips. In Cinebench R20, AMD expects the Ryzen 7 4800H to outperform both the Core i7-9750H and Core i9-9980H, of course, 10th gen parts are coming soon from Intel in the H series, but we don't expect performance to improve significantly over what is already available. Notably, AMD didn't compare the 4800H to the Core i9-9980HK, which is Intel's higher clocked flagship 45 watt CPU, although that chip is typically either found in only massive laptops or in thinner laptops with pretty hard throttling. Most of AMD's other comparisons focused on 4800H versus 9750H, which of course is appropriate because the 9750H is the most popular 9th gen 8 series parts. And predictably, with two extra cores, the AMD part goes on to dominate. Both systems have the same discrete GPU in NVIDIA's RTX 2060. AMD is also suggesting that with a GPU like the RTX 2060, that gaming performance will be higher with the Ryzen 7 4800H over the Core i7-9750H, sometimes significantly so depending on how CPU limited the game is at 1080p. Again, this is something we'll have to explore further. And finally, we did get some Ryzen 9 4900HS numbers comparing this CPU to the Core i9-9980H. AMD CPU does fare very well here in their numbers at 35 watts up against the 9980H at 45 watts. Although, again, as with everything here, we'll take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so that's all the performance stuff out of the way. Let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the architectural improvements AMD has made with Ryzen 4000. Not going to go over all the incredibly tiny little architecture details here, but there are some cool additions that caught my eye. Firstly, there has been a lot of discussion around the GPU being Vega rather than AMD's newer Navi design based on RDNA. However, AMD have made significant updates to the Vega core for Ryzen 4000 APUs that allows it to deliver up to 59% more performance per compute unit. You can see some of the improvements here, but the big ones include some architectural changes targeting efficiency, as well as higher clocks and more memory bandwidth. While this new design does allow for 59% higher performance per compute unit, there is a reduction in total compute units from 11 down to 8. When you crunch the numbers and extrapolate a bit, this means AMD are expecting around 16% higher graphics performance overall, comparing 8 of these new CUs to 11 last generation CUs. However, we don't know what real world performance gains will look like until we do some benchmarking and I suspect the memory bandwidth improvements will be pretty huge there. The memory system is improved in Ryzen Mobile. We are getting support for up to DDR4-3200 or LPDDR4-X 4266. This matches Intel's Ice Lake on the DDR4 side while offering even higher performance in the LPDDR4-X route, noting that Ice Lake tops out at 3733 support. But even better news for this APU is how it will split memory between the GPU and the CPU. In previous generations, this was fixed and often set by the OEM to something like 512MB or 1GB. With Renoir, the new APU series, this frame buffer allocation is now dynamic. If the GPU needs more VRAM, it can allocate more memory to the GPU, and when the CPU is primarily being used, it can ramp down the GPU allocation significantly. This will help a lot of 8GB systems that were often limited to just 6GB of usable memory with Ryzen 3000, but it will also have significant implications for GPU performance and being able to allocate more memory for the GPU in GPU intensive uh, you know, applications and that sort of thing. Power is also a big question mark with Ryzen 4000, given this wasn't a strong point of AMD's last generation products. AMD says that Ryzen 4000 APUs, thanks to Zen 2, deliver twice the amount of instructions per unit of energy. In other words, they're twice as efficient. AMD also touts other impressive gains for power consumption. The Infinity Fabric now delivers up to 75% better power efficiency thanks to the optimizations in the fabric. The shift to new, faster memory technologies also improves performance without affecting efficiency in a significant way. On top of that, AMD has been able to reduce SOC power by 20%. So not only are we getting much higher levels of performance within the same power envelope, AMD is also hitting lower SOC power when performance isn't needed, such as idle states and low intensity tasks. Many improvements to power consumption will also come from Ryzen 4000's ability to better manage clock speeds. These APUs are able to boost up to high frequencies more quickly, drop down to lower 
clock speeds more quickly and then maintain those low clock speeds for longer. In one case with PC Mark 10's App Start benchmark, AMD reported 59% lower power consumption during the execution phase. AMD were also kind enough to break down the battery life they achieved in their testing with the Ryzen 7 4800U in the Lenovo Yoga Slim 7 and compared it to the Dell XPS 13 with Intel's latest chip, the Ice Lake Core i7-1065G7. There was a lot of lead up to this part, but here's the numbers and we'll focus on the normalized Dell numbers here. The 4800U and AMD's numbers delivered better battery life for light productivity and gaming, as well as similar battery life for video playback. However, it fell behind in heavy core activity as well as low power idle states. This seems to be a fairly honest look at what to expect with Ryzen 4000. Again, we'll have to test it, but the results certainly are interesting. AMD even joked that Intel CPUs are great at doing nothing when describing the discrepancy between Ryzen and Ice Lake idle battery life, where Ryzen still seems to be less efficient. Overall though, through some funky maths and blending it all together, AMD expect system battery life to be similar to their Intel counterparts. We'll see how that plays out. A few other quick tidbits to end this one. Ryzen 4000 APUs integrate a new multimedia engine with a 31% faster encoder and support for new formats, including 4K60 decoding of VP9, which is key for YouTube, and 4K60 encoding of HEVC. The last thing I want to talk about is the change in how boost behavior works. AMD now have a feature called Skin Temperature Tracking Version 2, or STTV2, that allows better measuring of the surface temperatures of a mobile device. This is then fed back into the APU and used for boost management. The result is a Ryzen 4000 APU that can boost for longer when the outer surface of the laptop is cooler, for example if it hasn't been heavily utilized just prior to the workload being run. AMD had a demo running that showed this feature substantially increasing performance in the first few minutes of a high intensity workload as it essentially just holds boost clocks and a higher power limit for longer. Intel introduced something similar to their mobile chips in the latest generation called Adaptix, so we'll have to see how those things compare. And that's pretty much it for all the information we can share right now on these Ryzen 4000 APUs. Hopefully we'll be able to bring you some real world benchmarks in the next few weeks or so, but systems are coming soon and performance is looking quite impressive. Everything that I've seen so far suggests this will be a single APU solution for both high performance productivity and solid GPU performance, something that Intel only offers right now in two separate lineups. Of course, they've got Comet Lake for productivity and Ice Lake for GPU. It's certainly poised to make AMD actually competitive in this space for the first time in a long time. Ryzen 2000 and 3000 weren't particularly amazing, but Zen 2 seems perfect for this sort of mobile type application. Again though, we'll have a full breakdown on how these chips perform as soon as we're allowed to share that information. That's it for this one. Hopefully the wind noises haven't been too bad for you. It's been pretty windy at the moment trying to film some of these videos lately, so yeah, maybe a few storms happening in Australia at the moment, but apart from that, uh, yeah, you should just subscribe for more hardware unbox content, and particularly some of our Ryzen 4000 testing that, as I said, we'll be sharing with you as soon as possible. We've also got a couple of interviews and other cool bits and pieces and videos coming up on Ryzen 4000 that we can publish in the next couple of days, so they're well worth checking out, and again, you need to be subscribed so that you can catch those directly in your inbox. You can also support all the testing that we do at Hardware Unbox through our Patreon page, where you'll get access to things like our Discord community, monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, and all of that. Check out the links in the description below, and I'll catch you in the next one.